and welcome to the 905er podcast. My name is Roland Tanner, and today we're looking at the Progressive Platform, except we're not, because they don't have one. Um, but we are looking at um, we're looking at what they've promised, um, <laughs> and uh, the fact that they don't have a platform also, will, will, I'm pretty sure, will come up. Um, uh, what they've promised, what they've done in the past, obviously they have a track record now, and you know, although they don't seem to be really playing by the rules of the other parties, um, we want to treat them just the same as everybody else and look at some good things, uh, some bad things, and some, well, some other things. <laughs> Um, and Joel, you, you, you've really gone the extra mile to try and um, uh, look at <laughs> what they're promising because because we don't really know. Um, so why don't you? Well, I, yeah. What what have you found? Well, I had to. Like, yeah. Well, here, here's the thing. Like, yeah, you're right. The the other three parties that we covered, we were able to go to their websites and download PDFs of their platforms or their stated. Uh, electoral promises and see costing and detailed facts and figures on how they plan to accomplish what they said they were going to accomplish. Uh, as you said, Roland, they, the Tories do not have that. So to figure out what were they saying, um, I had to go and basically sift through all their press releases, uh, that they've released so far. Um, you know, and, and, and then kind of go back through news reports to see that what did they, what have they done? What have they announced and, and whatnot? There's, so this took a this is there's a re reason why we did this last. It took us a while to kind of sift through it all and put it together into a comprehensive plan uh, to or, or, or criticism to uh, to analyze and just see what they had to say. So as we've done with the others, we're going to start off with the good things. And yes, we do think there are some good things that the Tories have done. Um, as we all know, during COVID nineteen, uh, I, I, I'm going to give them a lot of credit, uh, or specifically to Doug Ford by. He took a stance against his own party uh, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, basically, if you remember during the, the height of the pandemic, he kicked out a number of members of his own caucus for either uh, actively undermining uh, uh, legislation or, or, or programs to help people uh, or to or to refuse to get vaccinated themselves when the rest of us were all scrambling to get it. Uh, so credit to that um you know the, the in in the in that light like you know you have uh one two three so there are four members that i identified that he just said no oh, you're done you're out you remember belinda Car carahelios who was the mpp for cambridge uh she voted against emergency legislation for the pandemic uh now she's running her and her husband are the head of the new blue party one of the fringe uh right-wing parties here in ontario now She's in charge of that. If you may remember, uh, Roman Babber, uh, York Simcoe, uh, excuse me, uh, York, one of, one of the York uh, MPPs, he was kicked out, kicked out for criticizing uh, the vaccine mandates and the restrictions, mask mandates and, and restrictions that are uh, that were put in place at the height of the pandemic. He's decided now he's running for the federal conservative leadership. Rick Nichols, if you may remember him, uh, he was kicked out because he decided he wasn't going to share his vaccination status. Now he's running with uh, Derek, uh, uh, what's his name, in the Ontario Party. Uh, again, another fringe right-wing uh, conservative group, small C conservative. And then last but not least, uh, Lindsay Park in Durham was kicked out after she claims that they misrepresented her vaccination status. And when I, so the aftermath of that, you can take what you want. That's up for debate. But I will give credit for Doug Ford for saying, I am kicking these people out because they don't toe the party line. Now, what that says about the Conservative Party as a whole, because if I recall, the Conservative Party itself had really only had these issues uh, pers that I'm aware of. That's a whole other episode, and we don't have time to get into that. But I will give credit to Doug Ford for taking the stance saying, no, that's it. I, you know, we are, we are the going to try and be the party of science and, and facts yeah i mean i mean to an extent this is what we do with doug ford is we, is we um we give him credit for not being as bad as he could be um but it is good because i don't think with the way the federal conservatives have been behaving the last few years that they would have kicked out the same people so thank goodness for that um you know doug ford through the covid crisis i think he's been very 
bad premier in a lot of ways in his um lack of backbone and his his willingness to kind of just change direction um but yeah. he's not a covid denier well, i think we that's to give him that you know? we'll get into that later i know yeah yeah that's I, I i do believe like he believes it's it the the dangers of covid now his prescriptions for handling the crisis we i will get into that as a criticism later on the episode um but that's it, 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 I, I will give him credit. Like he, he believed, he knew like this was a serious issue and this is something that we needed to take. We need, needed to take seriously and we needed to address, um, uh, uh, I'm going to say properly whether or not he had, he did that, that is open to debate. And that is, I think that's fair criticism, uh, on, on him as a leader, but moving on to, there are two other good things that we have, uh, wanted to focus on. The other was, I, I'm, I'm really behind this is a concept his his focus in the last um let me say the last few months uh and to give credit like he was focused on the covid 19 pandemic for a while so he's now that we're slowly coming out of it i think he's able to shift focus more economic matters and his focus on turning ontario into an electric vehicle manufacturing hub here in ontario is a good thing um his emphasis on trying to finally get access into the ring of fire to to get those materials to build battery many uh and 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 the materials associated with that battery production and whatnot here in the province to sell to the world is a great thing and it should be something that he should be commended for uh as well as working with the federal government to help secure funding for ford and fca uh fiat chrysler now uh stellantis uh i'm gonna say uh to invest in car electric car manufacturing here in ontario uh, and that is includes battery production, et cetera, is a good thing. But, and there's a big button that we'll get to that in terms of the bad things later. But right now that his, his want for wanting to do these things is a good thing. And I, I'm going to give him, uh, the, the green card, the, the go ahead on our front for his enthusiasm towards, towards this, the future of where we think, or at least I think, uh, Ontario manufacturing needs to go. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it it is good. I mean, it'd be nice if we just hadn't spent four years undermining that, undermining the market for EVs by, you know, what he cancelled yeah. uh, in two thousand eighteen. I mean, again, I, I simply can't let that go and pretend it didn't happen. I, I know you can't either. I mean, uh, uh, oh no, yeah. don't don't get me wrong. Like we, that that's the the criticism is there. I. Yeah, I mean, I, I I have a lot more to say on this later in the episode, so I don't want to kind of spill all my basket now. But um, yeah, we, I, I want to give credit where it's due, and I do like the fact that you know we don't we don't have to go and convince him now, like, hey, these electric cars they're not a fad, right? Like this is this is the future of auto manufacturing here in Ontario in the world. We need to get in on this now. Um, so yeah, uh, again, well, credit where it's due. That's really the best we can do, isn't it? Um, uh, you know, so yeah, okay, you're you're, you're you know uh, yeah. better late to the party than never to the party. Um, uh, I mean, um, yeah, obviously it's something that Ontario, yeah. Ontario's biggest, you know, most heavy duty kind of manufacturing uh, area is cars. So if we want, if we don't want that industry just to be dead within a couple of decades, this is the way to go. Um, uh so yeah good yeah. okay and uh, what's what's your what's the third thing that uh, we can give them credit for uh the the, the third thing that i, I want to give them credit for is uh, and this is entirely through uh press releases that that i've i've read uh the it, claims that he's going to make plans like to invest in a lot of new hospital manufacturing around the province um in terms of the 905, this is the 905 or podcast. In terms of the 905, it focuses down in Niagara region to uh, to build up in uh, in the, in the region the hospital system there, which is great. You know, we do. Lord knows, we've seen in this pandemic the need for better facilities, uh, expanded capacity, uh, and with those new hospitals, of course, means new nurses, new doc doctors hired to fill to just to staff it, which is a good thing. Um, however, there is a big asterisk, a big, butt on that. And basically I, I said in the 905, yeah, we're going to invest in Niagara Re Niagara region hospitals. Good. Not seeing a lot of attention in terms of Brampton and Peel region. 
Um, again, I don't know why. I, 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 at this point, I have to believe there's a bit of a personal uh, uh, vendetta against Brampton because they have Patrick Brown as their mayor still technically on the books. But we saw during the pandemic, uh, Peel Region just getting walloped by COVID-19, Brampton unable to really meet the the needs of its population through its own healthcare infrastructure. Clearly, if there's an argument to be made about upgrading there, I'm not, I don't see, I just, I don't see, I don't see that in, that attention and that in that focus on where it needs to go. Uh, give so again, give credit for the building new hospitals, always a good thing. Why, why, why are we not looking at the more comprehensive? approach to investing in our healthcare system as opposed to this you know i can't help but say like Ni- niagara region is sam userhoff is the mpp for niagara west there's a chance at winning a few conservative seats in that region you know is this more of a political play than a, uh, a are the niagara seats policy? and i'm thinking not not Oosterhof seats which is probably about as safe as they come but um some of the other niagara seats are uh will traditionally flip between liberals and pcs uh, are they more at risk than the brampton seats and so brampton i mean it, right. it, it's a you know traditionally we, we you know when hospitals get built you know, traditionally, well, they're just trying to get votes. Uh, and the funny thing is, they're not trying to get votes in in Brampton, where the, where they have, uh, I think, of the four MPPs, I think two are PC. Um, you know, so uh, Brampton is a is a is a strong it's a stronghold for the um, uh, PCs, or it should be. Uh, and a and a hospital could certainly make the difference between two seats and three seats. Um, uh, one of the NDP. P MPPs has just been deselected, so that they've kind of undermined themselves up there. Uh, and like you said, I mean, a really good point. Brampton mm-hmm. demonstrably needs more needs a hospital. Um, and it's been a, a crying need for a while now. We saw um, that uh, COVID hit Brampton very hard, um, much harder than Niagara. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, why? Why you know those those, those MPs whose whose uh, MPPs, sorry, whose names I can't remember, um, uh, which which tells its own story how faceless some of these MPPs are in in nine oh five writings, um, even when yeah. they hold ministries, uh, which I believe one of them does, if I remember rightly, um, uh, they seem eminently forgettable, and they don't. See, you know, part of the deal is like you know, just because your party wins doesn't mean you don't have you can't be an activist within your own party for your own riding's interests. I mean, that's absolutely what you should be. It's what people expect, right? Um, so. You know, where's Brampton's hospital? Yeah, it, it, it really, uh, and yeah, fine, yeah. Niagara, sure. Um, but I mean, again, I guess we can say at least he's, he's not closing hospitals. Well, also, but there, ben, do we have any guarantee that he won't be closing them in the future? You know, um, we have no guarantee at all. Well, um, it, who knows? But in terms of the yeah, good things, that's yeah. kind of all I got. I, I've got one <laughs> extra uh, tiny so, thing, which I just want to throw in, let's, and it, it, it's... Oh, go ahead. It's something that uh, I know is is it will made zero headlines, but I, I'm familiar with it from having when I ran in 2018. That the people who couldn't used to control the municipal voters lists, um, for some reason, it was not under the auspices of Elections Ontario. It was under um, uh, was controlled by another agency that generally dealt with completely other things that had nothing to do with with uh, voter lists. And as a result, it was those voters' lists were notoriously bad. And um, I think in 2019, the um, the government, the PC government, announced that it was going to transfer that to Elections Ontario so that we can basically use the Elections Ontario lists for municipal elections as well. And that was a really good thing. It's a small thing, but it's a good thing. Mm. There's no nonsense. It was a good decision, good call. Um, so, yeah, I'll give them credit for that. It, it's very small in the big scheme of things, but it's something I noticed that um, they did the right thing on. All right. Well, let's take a break for our sponsor, and we'll be back with all the bad things and all the criticism that you've been waiting for. <laughs> okay, folks, and we're back. So moving on, now all the bad things. And I know a lot of you are listening going, okay, this is going to be a three-part episode now, and it's not. We're just focusing on, on the three bad things uh that are a few bad things that we that we 
that kind of stood out to us. And I'm going to start off with the, this one is honestly puzzling to me, is the singular focus on Highway 413 that we've been hearing now from the, the Tories. They, they are doubling down on this project as this is their, if anything I could say is like a legacy project from the a platform, and I'm using air quotes on this one, it's this 413. They are just using this as, as some like, we're going to build stuff. However, I've yet to see a project in recent Ontario history that has received constant cr criticism and scrutiny in terms of a waste of money, a useless project, and a project that will probably do more harm than good uh, uh, in terms of the lasting lasting impacts down the road. Um, and then the fact that it's getting get, receiving so much scrutiny, like, I've, I've yet to hear of anyone in the press who's really backing this anymore. It's It's really like viewed as now what $10 billion is the estimated cost, which let's face it, folks, we know it's going to go beyond that. It always does. Um, carve up huge chunks of the green belt that are, we're not going to get back. And essentially what shave 30 seconds, half a minute off of a possible commute time around the GTA. Why would we do that? The only question, the only re rationale I could have for that is, um, I question like what's actually driving this project. Is it honest ideology of we need to build this thing? Or is it the fact that as we know from reporters, the the developers in this province have all bought up land, speculative land around the projected site for the construction and they're hoping to cash in big time on this down the road. So, you know, what's really driving this? Is it ideology or is it the developers in this province? Yeah, I can give you the answer to that. It's the developers in this province. Um, because if you, you look at... Uh, we mentioned a week or so ago uh, uh, just how well funded the the PCs are compared with the other parties. Um, they are, and I don't think it used to be this way. It didn't use. It wasn't this extreme. Um, uh, it was. It was fairer. Um, you know, the the banning of of corporate donations, as I keep on saying, didn't stop corporate donations. What it did do is stop corporate donations to the NDP because their donations came from. The unions it stopped donations to the liberals to a considerable degree because um a lot of businesses like the the healthcare industries don't do this but the developers which are tend to be you know larger or smaller are still kind of family businesses you know that the the development the big development industries are run by um you know joe smith or whatever um and joe smith will make big donations um you know pfizer won't do that because it's like no no they we, we stopped corporate donations so we're not donating anymore and the liberals traditionally would have done very well out of uh, uh you know the uh, pharmaceuticals and things like that as well as some of the unions um so we now have a situation where uh, one party is, is hardly knows what to do with the money that it's got floating around. It's got so much of it, and two other parties that that are you know scrabbling around at the edges. Um, now you know why? Why was I getting into that? Well, because you know so much of that money is coming from from the developers. Um, it you know, and they've they've invested in all that land. Um, they've invested in, they've invested in land. In every town in Ontario, in every, you know, if you look at any parking lot, any any side street mm -hmm. with a few rundown houses in, in a central urban area, any field on the outskirt of towns, you look at who owns that, it will be a developer. They've already, they bought up everything. And, of course, that money is down the drain unless they can build on it. Um, and, <sighs> yeah. But the downside, the downside is that we we are suffering for it because this this project doesn't. I just I'm not opposed to building highways, but let's not just build a highway for the sake of building a highway. And that's what this is. This is a highway for the sake of building a highway. It's going you know from Milton up to King City, far north of Vaughan. It's it's the only thing that would help is those in the in Milton and the 905 who are looking to get to Cottage Country. Uh, on on the weekend in the summer. Outside of that, you're not gonna. I can't picture any. Uh, transportation company saying yes, I'll I'll pay the mileage for you to go all the way I mean, up and down. It, it it's not will, going to save you any time on it that. It will point. have a purpose. If anything, it's going to cost you more. In one scenario, one scenario only. Like right now, as it is, as, as Ontario has been planned over the last couple of decades, it has no point. It goes nowhere that you can't get on the on the uh, uh, mm -hmm. on the um, blanked on the number. Is it four one six? No, which which number is it? <laughs> the toll road. Uh, Four seven. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I mean it, it does nothing. However, if 
you assume that both sides of that new road are going to be covered in houses, then it will have a purpose um, and it will have a function because those people will want to get places. So it, it, it's, yep. you know, it's like going back to the 19th century when people built ro- railways to nowhere because they knew that nowhere would become somewhere because of the railway. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is an environmental disaster of it's just cataclysmic a- proportions if they build this stupid thing. Um, uh, you know, yeah. Moving on, just moving on from that though, uh, the other bad items. So you might have heard in our, our, our good items list that we were saying how great it is that Ford wants to turn the province into the EV capital of North America. Fantastic. The bad thing is, I don't have a clue how he's going to do it. Um, <laughs> um, the I, I said I took put notes down here. It said the entire plan seems to be winging a prayer, and it really does. Um, as we recall, when he first got elected, he he got elected on scrapping the green. Uh, Green Energy Act by the previous liberal government, and whether you agree with it or not, that that bill structure was basically geared towards funding things like an EV tax credit, uh, as amongst other uh, tax renovations to help your house become more energy independent, energy affordable, all that stuff. That was all scrapped, and so all those benefits passed off, uh, ended. Ford didn't bring them back because presumably he thought, oh, they're a waste of money. The problem is. Uh, in the in the southern sorry in the south southwest in the states there are considerable federal tax rebates uh, for EV car purchases that are available for a wide swath of cars. Here in the, in Canada we only have five thousand dollars. In this province you only get five thousand dollars from the federal government to buy an EV car. Um, r- recently the statistic our, our reports have shown that people are hesitant to buy EV cars because they want them. There's the demand is there. The problem is the initial cost of purchasing them for a lot of families is they're too expensive. They need those tax credits to be available to a large swath of uh, uh, available cars that are coming onto the market. They need it to be available to make these cars more affordable to get them onto the market. Ford has no plans. Doug Ford has no plans to introduce a similar tax credit to give families a chance to change, flip over their cars. Here's where I'm going with this. Why would Ford, Stellantis, GM, Toyota, or any other place want to set up shop to massively retrofit existing plants to do sole, just EV car manufacturing? Or why would we want to get a a new factory built here when you're not going to be able to sell those items to this existing market? You're going to have to build those vehicles, put them on trucks, and then ship them down the 401 to get into the United States to get into the market there. That's, a ex- that's an extra cost to you. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to build uh, an electric car here, roll it off the assembly line, and somebody buys it kind of right off the lot. That's not going to happen here because we're just, we are not, we aren't going to be able to uh, afford them. Th- that's a huge problem. The other problem is there's no one, there's no plan that I've seen, a, a concrete plan to build up the charging infrastructure here in the province. The 401, what was built by the liberals, that's kind of been it. There's no, there's not a major incentive to tell the gas companies switch over to EV charging stations or to set up charging stations around the 905, along the 401, any of those places. So even if we do buy an electric car, we're basically charging it at a home, which is fine. But again, thinking holistically, we want people to travel across the province to go camping, to go, you know, to build up that tourism industry again and seeing the great province. Well, if you're, if you're told drive, drive to where you want to camp or drive to where you want to see, what's good if I say, well, I can't charge my car when I get there. I'm stuck using the old fashioned gas, uh, uh, gas method. So I don't, just saying I want to turn into the EV building capital is not enough for me. You you got to have a, a whole plan to shift everybody from the internal combustion engine to an EV model. And we can't do that just by saying, well, wait, somebody else will pick up the tab for it. That's not what's going to happen. We need them to actually step in here and say, we're going to invest in the infrastructure, the the charging stations, the the tax credits to help jumpstart yeah, this, I mean, this I, transition. I think- yeah, you know, I've seen you know, multiple people make make the point. And I was watching a YouTube video the other day by someone who drove from basically drove across the states in an electric vehicle, and and um, uh, you know they also are, are lagging behind in infrastructure. But but uh, um, and m- many of the charging stations that do exist are don't work properly and things like this. 
However, I mean, like you said, he'd had a car for about three years. It was the first time he'd ever had to plug it in on the road because usually you just charge it at home, which is something we can't do with gas cars and is far more convenient and it happens overnight. Mm -hmm. But despite that, we, we, yeah, we do need infrastructure. And uh, as in so many ways, it's not being planned. It's just, you know, hoping that the market will provide or whatever and, and, you know, there's just better ways of doing things, isn't there? Um, uh, yeah, hoping hoping the market will provide is the uh, conservative mantra of we just don't want to do the job. Yeah, uh, and, and, and uh, the other on on that on I want to also point out on the on the EV note um, in their press releases, they're they're and so again, the mixed messaging here. So they say, oh, we're going to cut gas prices by saying, oh, we're going to cut 5.7 cents per liter uh, from gas prices, presumably through uh, provincial gas tax, which again, it's the, it, I don't get it. If you're trying to push for EV car manufacturing and adoption in the province, you don't cut, you don't make it cheaper to fill up your tank of gas. Now, here's the other thing. I don't think we're going to see prices come down. That's not how it's, that, that's never worked. Every time a province, every time the, the PCs say they're going to do this, we're going to cut the gas tax because that's going to bring down the cost. It brings down the cost for a day. And then the gas companies find another reason to raise the price of gas 10 cents a liter. And they, they just recoup all that profit. And meanwhile, we, you and I, taxpayers, we lose revenue because the government doesn't get that revenue back. And it's a, it's a, and our, we just end up paying more money out of pocket for gas. We don't get any tax revenue to, you know, maybe go into building more EV charging stations or whatnot. It's their entire, they say they want to do this. Their plans are completely winging a prayer in a, an asinine. Um, and la- the last point I want to make on that is Ford likes to stand up at the podium and say how, um, the liberals didn't get the ring of fire developed when they're in their mandate. Um, that is true. I remember Dalton McGinty saying he wanted to develop the Ring of Fire up in north to help manuf- help uh, manufacturing and whatnot. However, Ford has had four years to do this, and he hasn't done anything. There's been nothing done in four years. Uh, he hasn't built on what the liberals did beforehand, and he's not doing it now. I don't, I don't see why all of a sudden now, in the next four years, Ford's all of a sudden magically going to be able to get this all, all done. Yeah, I mean, I mean... Um, Sometimes don't, yeah. things don't happen because they're really difficult and there's barriers in the way. I don't particularly understand the whole ring of fire thing, other than I think we should, and we probably haven't um, recognized the importance of indigenous land rights in the whole thing. Um, it's like, hey, we've got this whole area which is full of minerals, and let's let's destroy it because <laughs> you know, we can't. I mean. It's not that simple, I, I know, and, and Canada is rich in um, in raw materials, and it's, it's one of our strengths, and one of the things that, that, that has always been and will continue to be why uh, it makes our economy strong. But yeah, sometimes when something doesn't happen under a government, it, it's because there's there's a good reason for it, and like you say, I don't see any evidence. I mean, I don't see evidence. You know, what has this government done in the last four years? You know, what it was the thing it can point to and say. You know, look, I mean, I know they're saying, you know, I'm, I'm sure they wanted, I'm sure Doug wanted the, the slogan of this election to be get her done rather than get it done. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> well, that's, that's, def- that's, definitely what have they done? Places, you know, I mean, um, uh, well, that's the thing, like, ne- <laughs> listeners, please email us. I, I, I need to know, name one project that they have said from the, be- not even just a project that they've done that the results have not been ideal. Tell me one project that they have started. They said, we're going to do this and they did it and it didn't and, and did not end up being a disaster or them having to cancel the project and retract it. We all remember the, the license plates, how much that's the millions of dollars that cost us. And they had to call it back. The buck of beer. That was yeah, a failure. For, for, for a government um, which has no kind of that vision or intellectual raison d'etre or anything. Even on the piddling little populist things that they made such a fuss about, they failed. You know, and and the, the one thing you can point to is yep. developers. It's like, okay, developers have won. The law has changed to yes. go from a position of massive strength for developers to a position of massive, enormous strength for developers. <laughs> um, well, thanks. Well, that's but, the thing. Uh, well, one of the, one of the bad items, so 
with the one of the bad items, the last ba bad item I'm going to talk about um, before moving on to our open ended criticism, um, their housing plan. If, we, if listeners of the podcast remember a few weeks ago before the uh, the rent was dropped, we were talking about the um, uh, the housing task force uh, plan, and there was interesting things like you know all less authorized middle density uh, development and all that stuff. Here's the thing: the actual plan put forward to put into legislation. Basically, it was just, let's give over all of this to the developers. Let's just say to the developers, do you want to build? We're going to just neuter the, the municipalities to be able to fight fight back on it. We're not going to care about um, enforcing a variety of needs. The idea of, like, oh, the market will provide. The market is basically going to be this. You're going to get tons of high-rise developments that are going to be one or two-bedroom condos, small two, two, one or two-bedroom condos. Uh, going for about a million dollars, or you're going to have these big sprawling McMansion homes uh, being developed with spinning, you know, little pockets of like a, a bare lot that they can build a few homes on. That will be your town town homes. But in terms of that comprehensive, let's provide a variety of different sized housing options so a market could actually develop. That people say, well, I I don't need this. I need that. I'll I'll I can afford this. I can afford that. We're going to have McMansions two bedroom condos, that'll be our market, which is not a housing affordability plan. And that's a big kick in the teeth, I think, for people who say, oh yeah, we're going to build. They're going to build. It's not going to be what we need. Yeah, uh, 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 mark my words. It's, <laughs> yeah, they don't even have the courage of the convictions when they, you know, they, they formed uh, the housing affordability task force and they, they gave it about six months to, to come up with the answers to life, the universe of everything. Uh, and to be fair to the task force, it came up with some pretty bold recommendations. Uh, and those, you know, I thought the, you know, the recommendations on, on, uh, on, uh, the, you know, the missing middle, the, the single family home neighborhoods, I thought were too wholesale, but they were moving in absolutely the right direction. We do need infinitely more uh, new housing going into single family home neighborhoods. Well, not infinitely more. We need much more. Uh, and we need the, the kind of blanket ban on, on right. touching single family home neighborhoods to go away and die. Um, I, I, I'm too much of a believer in democracy to think that we just just say as of right do what you hell up to the hell you want up to this height uh, to think that that was smart. Um, however, the, as a general principle, I, I'm I'm on board with that. But of course, that was the one thing that immediately they killed. The one thing that that, that would have an obvious, immediate, and dramatic effect on affordable housing and uh, housing density and reducing the pressure on greenfields was the one thing they said, oh, no, well, you know, the, the voters are going to hate that, so out that goes. Uh, because they have no principles. They have no vision. There is no... There's no there there, you know? There's nothing at the core of this other than the desire to be in power for another four years. Uh, um, and, you know, I mean, thankfully, Doug, is so vapid and, uh, and lacking in principle that that he's not in bed thus far with the real with the religious nut bars and and the the Oosterhoffs of this world. Um, but they're there and they're thereabouts, and they can hold a considerable amount of power in his party. So uh, you know, it, it's uh. well. The I thought the good thing about um, doing the the Tories last is that unlike the other three parties, is that we. I think their criti the criticism towards the Tories that they have a reputation that we can look on. Like we we can look back and say, look at the last four years. How based on their behavior, what can we infer the next four years will be like? And I find even their their projects to that they want to move forward. There's no consensus amongst the various stakeholders in this province to move forward on any of these. Um, let's let's fit the elephant in the room: COVID. Um, their reputation during COVID was very wishy-washy. There wasn't nobody felt that they had a strong hand on the wheel. How many times did we talk in this podcast about how you know one week, one day, Doug Ford in a minute in the, and Christine Elliott would stand up in front of the microphone and say, "No man, no mandates. We're going to loosen everything up." And then the next day, the chief medical officer stands up and says, "Yeah, I got to, I got to put in some restrictions now." Or uh, especially if you're a parent of a student in. Uh, in the school system, my God, were you stressed out every time Stephen Lecce took to the microphone? Because you were told you'd hear one day from him, "Oh, we're going to, uh, you know, everything's 
straight and narrow. We're going to, schools are going to open. We're going to be safe and sound. No, no online learning. And then the next day, oh, guess what? We got to put, go to online learning now. And it's this roller coaster of just stress and nerves because the online learning, that's the other, sorry, that's the one thing I didn't write down. I should have, and I, I kicked myself in the teeth for doing it. Online learning, they are still can, intent on bringing forth an online learning platform, despite the fact that we have seen firsthand the necessity of it in co during the pandemic, it did not work. It will not work. It is a very much still a flawed program that needs a lot of work to be done with it, yet we're still pushing forward on it. It's part of the curriculum to maintain that your kids in high school will have to do some kind of online learning component to get their, uh, their diploma despite the fact that we know it does not yeah. work. And that's kind of it. It's this blind push forward and just, it, it's good. We're going to make it work when we're going to, somebody else will make it work, not us. Uh, and the fact is they can find, um, you know, obviously COVID runs a coach and horses through all kinds of things. Yeah. So, so budget deficits have gone up. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the, four years ago, they would have made a huge stink about the fact that we're reducing debt and all this kind of stuff. But they can find $13 billion uh, down the back of the sofa to build a road uh, to keep their developer friends happy. But they, yeah. you know, what kind of moron wants to make the education system worse? You know, that is a competitive advantage uh, uh, as, a, as a country, as a province, is that our education system is far from perfect, but compared with other countries, you know, if you actually do a like-for-like -like comparison, it's been pretty good. It could be much better, but it's pretty good. You know, if you run down, if you make us less well-educated, if you if you underfund schools, if you, you know, aren't giving the best kind of education to our children, that just means that you know we're we're trying to compete with 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 countries where which are you know we should be competing with the best not with the worst because we pay we have to pay the best wages anyway <laughs> you know we, well that's the thing it's like we we either do a race to the bottom or we start saying no we're gonna we're gonna lead the pack and we can't lead the pack if we're not smart um it, it comes down to that i i'm i'm i i'll leave the caveat like i do i think we need more technology in our classrooms but it needs to be done in the right way and in a way that is accessible for all. It should be used as a tool, not as a, a sales gimmick. Uh, the, the, one, the one thing, the theme that I kind of get from this government over the last four years has been this, this government comes in looking for a fight. It's not here to solve problems. It is here to pick a fight. F think back to the beginning prior to COVID people, like just flash back to this very start of this term of this government. We had rotating strikes with the teachers unions for coming on two years. COVID is the one that ended that. It wasn't a, an, agree, an ultimately agreement between the government and the, and the unions. If they get into power, I don't see that ending. I, th I see uh, teachers, nurses, and doctors. This government has burnt a lot of bridges with them. They're gonna, there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of battles coming forward. Now, you might be the person who thinks that the unions have too much power uh, and you're, you're just, you hate unions altogether. So be it. I get it. But let's be honest here. Do we really need another four years of battles, protests, picket lines, and all that? Like, we, we, we need to move forward. I don't see that changing underneath this government. Where the priorities in this province have been for the last few, four years have been very clearly towards large corporations uh, and developers over the needs of individual families, such as you and myself, or small businesses that are supposedly the backbone of this economy. It is, we've seen tax breaks and favors done for large corporations and the developers. Everyone else has been fight, you know, let's go fight. Let's go pick a fight. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and you know, we, we, but we really need four years of that. Small businesses and this government's done nothing, nothing, like less than nothing for us. Um, uh, whereas, you know, the, 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 the federal government, during COVID, did stuff, you know. Um, uh, yep. Yeah, it's a sort of like you know, even even on their own criteria yeah. of being like the pro business party or whatever, they fail. They fail on everything, and, and I think they, you know, the reason they don't want to talk to us, the reason they don't want to talk to anybody, the reason they don't go to debates, you know, no, they don't even go to the bloody chamber of commerce debates anymore. For God's sakes, I mean, it's like yep. you couldn't make it a friendlier bloody audience for them. They don't 
talk to anybody. They don't want to talk to, they won't tell us what they're going to do. They won't write down what it is that, I mean, I find this so incredibly offensive and so incredibly upsetting and damaging. You know, I used to hear people talking about, you know, this is bad for democracy. You know, 20 years ago, you'd hear people saying that and I'd think, oh, get over it. You know, democracy's here. It's here to stay. But now, and now I find myself saying that same stuff because, well, no, this, they just, they're not even playing the game anymore. They're not even in the same room as the other parties. It's, it's uh, utterly cut off from, from, from how it's supposed to work. Here's my, my criticism of it is this, these elections, this is basically a a, a transaction of promises um, between a potential government and the people is these the, the the four parties are supposed to put forward platform. This is what we will do if you give us your vote. And we, the people, sit and we we're supposed to weigh the argument and we see it in writing because the idea is that in writing we give we give a, a party our vote. They get elected and we hold them accountable. We go to them and say, no, no, you put it in writing. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. You did not do it. Why did you not do it? And we might agree with your rationale or not, but the idea is you put it in writing. You didn't do it. That's it. Next time you're out. We're going to put in, we're going to give somebody else a shot. When these, when the Tories, when the PCs do not put their promises into writing, it should raise a red flag. It means they're not going to be held accountable. They're not going to say, you can, you can go back. Now I know right now they're saying, oh no, the, the recent budget that they tabled, they tabled and nobody voted on it. That's the running on. They're going to say, we're, if you elect us, we're going to reintroduce that budget uh, at the first chance uh, in the next uh, legislature. I don't buy it because it's not in writing. It is a bill right now. It is, it's up in the air. It's not, it, it, it's, it's gone. There's, it's not, it's not. No, and we, we can't even, anymore. we can't download if it. They come back and say, document, it's not on their website. Um, and it, uh, we were discussing this before we came on air. It's a plan for one year, not for four years. It's, uh, uh, yes. uh, and, and like party platforms actually have a kind of quasi neo legal status within our system. I mean, I mean, why were people so angry with with Justin Trudeau when he abandoned the electoral reform thing? Well, partly because it was in the platform. And it was like this is going to be the last time we hold a first past the post election in the platform. He broke that promise. We voted, you know, it, we voted on that basis. Uh, you know, that there has been case law i think in other other countries of you know parties um saying oh well you know don't take any notice of the platform uh we can do what we like and, and so sort of judges saying no no you you can't actually do that <laughs> or at least you have to take the consequences so the, the fact they're just they're just not it's, willing to it's really it, it's contempt for the voter it's contempt for yeah like i grew up my parents were died in the wool conservative blue bluer than blue people um and part of the reason, well, no, the reason I'm not is there are many and multifarious reasons why I'm not. But, you know, I should not be this item of contempt where they weren't, like, I, as someone who is progressive, I am in effect dead to them. Now, I actually had a phone call from the MP, uh, the uh, candidate for PC MP P of burlington today and i screwed up because i didn't pick up the phone because it, it was a, an unknown number and then i realized what it was but i had put my name down but she sent me an email saying um you know uh, unfortunately i have a scheduling problem that's the biggest lie anybody tells during an election that they have a scheduling problem with a debate no one has a scheduling problem with a debate if you don't want to go to it it's because you don't want to go to it. That is the only thing. So she's letting people, call, uh, you know, uh, set up fo phone calls with her. Uh, sorry, it doesn't cut the biscuit. I'm very annoyed that I didn't pick up the phone and speak to her. Uh, but I mean, to an extent, I would have been slightly dishonest in kind of tricking someone into speaking to me that way. But uh, how else are we, are we supposed to make a, a judgment on these people? She can't speak to 100,000 citizens of Burlington through phone interviews on, on a couple of days. Uh, you know, it, the dishonesty of it the, the drives me insane. I mean, and it is deeply damaging we, for democracy because these people her... don't seem to believe in democracy and they're making it kind of obvious that they don't. I'll just say that I, we're coming up on our, on our time, so we'll leave it at that. Um, I, I, we, I think we deserve better. Um, I don't think we're going to get it this election. Um, and that's 
there's plenty of talk criticism for the progressive parties. We've done it and we've kind of outlined our reasons why we think the progressive parties aren't clicking, but I don't, we, we do deserve better. And we need as a society, as Ontarians, we need to start demanding better. We see, we need to start paying attention more to it because we're going to, the next four years is shaping up to be another conserv another four years of what we, uh, we Yeah, we do. Um, I'm kind of, re I'm resigning, I'm resigning myself to that fact. And I just think we, if that's the case, we need to start paying attention more and demanding more of, of our, our leaders. And we can't yeah. let this I mean, I go by for a four we years un accept, un unquestioned. We cannot accept any longer. We've accepted it for decades and decades. We cannot accept the leaders of progressive parties who basically are running out versions of the same platform to allow the progressive conservatives to win because, because of purely party interest, they have to get their act together. You know, if, if it's a one-time deal for, you know, the, the, we have Trump, we have Ford, we have extremists in Europe, we have the, these right-wing demagogues on the right everywhere. We have the Christian fundamentalists, we have other religious fundamentalists all on the rise, all pushing back the hard-won won liberties that people have won over the last century. Uh, and we're letting them get away with it because the damn NDP or the damn liberals or the damn Labour Party in Britain or the this Democrats in the States would rather lose thinking that, well, next time we'll get them and it'll be our party than thinking, no, if we don't do something now, we're going to lose the war, not just the battle. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's got to stop. And I know it's kind of ex extreme language that we're using, but I really think we're at that point now. No, it's... It's fair. Um, on that note, we're going to call it to an end because the, the episode time is uh, flashing for us. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening to us. And we'll be back on Thursday with another okay. episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>that's it for this episode of the 905er thank you for listening as always you can send us your feedback thoughts and concerns or ideas for future episodes to our email info at 905er.ca we'd love to hear from you you can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through patreon as well as paypal visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab as well links are in the show notes for your convenience Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. out of this life and optimize your personal wellness then check out the natural man podcast join me host mike c as we explore all areas of human wellness physical mental and emotional learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health remember your doctor works for you learn biohacks neurohacks ways to improve sleep and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.